Mary. They pastor a church that is so far up there in Wisconsin that uh, it, it's not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there, from, from where they live. Yeah, it's up there by Northern Grace Youth Camp which is about a five-hour drive, as I know from having driven many of our children up to Northern Grace Youth Camp. Well, let's open our Bibles together at this time to the book of Romans, chapter 3, and verse 9. Romans 3, 9, for our message from the Word of God this morning. Romans 3, 9 will be found on page 1194 if you're using the church Bible this morning. This morning being March 31st, 2024, our text is going to begin in Romans 3, 9 and go on down through verse 18. And the title of this morning's message is An Unflattering Picture of Mankind. An Unflattering Picture of Mankind. And we begin with the story of a man who was sitting in his living room one Easter Sunday afternoon when he heard music coming from the family room. So he walked into the family room and found that the music was coming from his wife who was singing. And he said, Oh, I, I thought you were the stereo. And she said, well, I'm flattered that you thought I was the stereo. Did, did you come in to, to listen? And he said, no, I came in to turn it off. <laughs> well, speaking of being flattered, here in Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is about to paint a very unflattering picture of mankind and their sinfulness. But he begins by posing the question of whether Jewish sinners are any better than Gentile sinners. As you see in verse 9 of Romans 3 where Paul wrote these words. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Now to begin with, I remind you that Paul himself was a Jew. And if you've been with us for our study, you know that he's been speaking to Jews ever since Romans 2 and verse 17, trying to convince them that they were sinners who needed to get saved, just like the Gentiles. And after presenting nearly two dozen verses to prove that, he asks them here in verse 9, What then? Do you still think that Jews are better than Gentiles? Which, by the way, unsaved Jews did think in Paul's day, and a lot of unsaved Jews still think that today. But as Paul says here in verse 9, He's already proved Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. 
He proved that Gentiles are sinners in Romans 1. And then he proved that Jews are sinners in Romans 2. But Jews thought they were better than Gentiles because they didn't sin as much or as badly as Gentiles. Gentiles were famous for their sinfulness. As you can tell when Paul told Peter in your first reference in Galatians 2.15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. <laughs> now, he didn't mean to say that Jews didn't sin. They just weren't known for committing sins like fornication and drunkenness like the Gentiles were. Their sins were more like what we would today call white-collar crimes. <laughs> sins like telling little white lies, cheating on their taxes. But they were still sinners. As Paul says, they were under sin. But what does it mean to be under sin? But did you ever watch a documentary about World War II on television and hear a man say that he served under General Patton during the war? That word under that can mean under the rule or command or dominion of someone or something. As we see when David prayed in Psalm 8 verses 4 and 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under man's feet. And the works of God's hands there are the animals that God created with man. Animals are under the rule of man because God gave man dominion over the animals as it says in that psalm there. And as it also says in your next reference where God the Father said to God the Son and to the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1.26 Let us make man and let them have dominion over fish, fowl, and cattle. So, animals are under man. But what's Paul mean when he says man is under sin? Well, Adam was under the rule or dominion of God when he was created. But, when he sinned, he came under the dominion of sin. Sin was now his ruler instead of God. He used to serve God as his ruler. But now he had to serve sin. As the Lord said in John 8, 33 and 34, when some Jews told him, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. Jesus answered them, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now that word bondage there is the Bible word for slavery. Those unsaved Jews in their religious pride were forgetting that they spent over 400 years in bondage to the Egyptians. But the Lord had more important things to do that day than to give them a history lesson. He knew they needed to understand they were now slaves 
of sin. That they were owned by sin in the same way that slaves are owned by masters. Now, as we're going to see in the book of Romans, slaves could be redeemed out of slavery. In your next reference, in Nehemiah's day, some penniless broke Jews sold their sons into slavery. And then they said in Nehemiah 5.5, 5, We bring into bondage our sons, neither is it in our power to redeem them. They were so poor, they had to sell their own sons into bondage. And they couldn't afford to buy them back. And when Adam sinned, he sold himself to sin. And he doomed the entire human race to bondage, to sin, when they sinned. And now men need to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. As Paul is going to talk about later in this very chapter. But, for now, he's going to go on in our text to give the Jews even more proof that they too were under sin. Because he knew that Jews would need more convincing because they were the God's chosen people. So he's about to quote a boatload of scriptures from the Jewish Bible to convince them that they were just as much under sin as Gentiles. And he starts in Romans 3.10 where he says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. Now if you're not sure what that word righteous means, uh, the verse that Paul is quoting actually defines it in Psalm 14 and verse 3 where David says there is none that doeth good no not one so there is none righteous means that there is none that do good all the time there is none that never sold themselves into bondage to sin by committing a sin like Adam did. And listen, unrighteousness is an extremely serious spiritual condition to, for men to be in. Because we've already seen in our study of Romans what's going to happen someday to all unrighteous men in Romans 2, 8 and 9. Where Paul wrote, Unto them that obey unrighteousness, you know, as a servant obeys his master, wrath is coming upon every man that doeth evil. And we know that the wrath it's talking about there is the wrath of hell. Because Paul told the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators or thieves or drunkards and a whole lot of other sins he lists there shall inherit the kingdom of God. And listen. Listen. There's a reason why Paul says there that they shouldn't be deceived about what he's saying. And the reason is that men always fool themselves into thinking they don't need to be saved from their sins and that they will inherit the kingdom of God. That's why verse 11 of our text goes on to say, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. 
When Paul says there's none that understandeth, he means that there's none that understands what a serious spiritual condition they're in. Men always deceive themselves into thinking, well, everybody sins, so it's not that big a deal. <laughs> And that makes their serious condition even more serious. Because if you don't know you're dying of cancer, you're not going to seek a doctor to save you from cancer. And if men don't know they're dying eternally a sin, they're not going to seek God to save them from their sin. And those verses say they don't understand that. And, and this was also something that was written in the Jewish scriptures. As we see in Psalm 14, 2 and 3. Where David tells us how the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand. What a serious condition they're in. And seek God to save them from it. They're all gone aside. The Lord scoured the earth looking for a man who understood that he needed to seek God. And he found they'd all gone aside. And it doesn't say except the Jews, does it? And the Jews, the Jews should have sought God because they had something that made them seek God. Something that the Gentiles didn't have. Something you read about in Hosea 7 and verse 10 where it says, The pride of Israel testifieth to his face and they do not seek him. And the pride of Israel, folks, was the Ten Commandments. And you know that because when Moses gave the Jews the Ten Commandments, he said in Deuteronomy 4, 6-8, The nations shall say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law? <laughs> well, let me ask you. If you heard whole nations talk that way about you, wouldn't you get a little puffed up <laughs> with pride about it? And by the way, the Ten Commandments were kept in the Ark of the Covenant, right? And the ark was sometimes called what Exodus 25-22 calls it. The ark of the testimony. The Ten Commandments. The pride of Israel testified to their face that they couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. It testified that to them every time they read them. The Lord got in their face about their need to seek him to save them. And still, they didn't seek him. So God spanked them by letting the Syrians conquer them. And you would think that that would make them seek God, but what does it say about that in Isaiah 9, 12? And 13. The Syrians shall devour Israel with open mouth. And yet, for all this, the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. And folks, when a kid doesn't respond to spanking, there's not much hope for him. Now, here let me pause to assure you that when Paul says there's none that seeketh after God, 
Jews are, would be thinking of all these verses that I just showed you saying that they didn't seek God in spite of all that God had done for them. But Paul's not done quoting scripture yet. He's got more to say from the Jewish scriptures. In verse 12 he says they are all gone out of the way. Together, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And it didn't take the Jews very long to go out of the way that God had laid out for them because when Moses was still up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments in writing, what does it say in Exodus 32, 7 and 8? The Lord said unto Moses, Go, get down the mountain, for thy people... Uh, don't you love that? They're your people when they're misbehaving, Moses. Yeah. <laughs> thy people have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They made a calf, and they're worshiping it. And that's why David says in Psalm 14 and verse 3, your next reference, they are all gone aside, Jews and Gentiles, together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. And that's the verse that Paul's quoting in verse 12 here. And the problem with turning aside out of God's way is that it won't be long before you're doing what Isaiah 53, 6 says. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And when Isaiah said, we have turned everyone to his own way, he was speaking as a Jew to the Jews. So, the Jews should have known from their own scriptures that they were not exempt from these verses saying that all men are sinful and need to be saved. But the worst thing about sin is what Paul says in the middle of verse 12 there. It makes men unprofitable to God. God made men to profit from men the way any creator wants to profit from anything that he creates. But as verse 12 says there, Jews and Gentiles have together become unprofitable. But the Jews didn't have to take Paul's word for it because we've seen scriptures saying so and look what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7.20 For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now, maybe you've been thinking, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I know plenty of unsaved men who do good from time to time. Some of them act better than some Christians act. But if that's what you're thinking, you need to understand that even the good things that unsaved men do are sins in the eyes of God. As you see from Proverbs 21.4, a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. And Farmer Brown goes out and fires up the old John Deere tractor or Massey Ferguson or whatever it is he fires up. And he goes out to plow his field. You would think that he'd be doing a good thing. Because listen, one of the Ten Commandments said, Six days shalt thou labor, and then you can rest on the Sabbath. Half of that commandment says you have to work for a living. But Proverbs says, when an unsaved man does it, it's sin. 
Because Proverbs says he does it out of pride, a proud heart. His pride tells him that he can keep the Ten Commandments well enough to be saved, and he can't. And we know that the good works of unsaved Jews are also sins. Because a Jew named Isaiah said in Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The Jews did what everybody did. They, they, they tried to wipe away the sins of their bad works with good works of righteousness. But God says that the rags of those good works are filthy with sin in his eyes. And that even included the things that unsaved Jews did in the New Testament. As part of their, I'm sorry, as unsaved Jews did in, uh, in Deuteronomy 33.19, I should say, in the Old Testament. We'll get to the New Testament sins in a minute. In Deuteronomy 33.19, it talks about sacrifices of righteousness. Unsaved Jews who thought they were keeping the Ten Commandments well enough to be saved, they would bring animal sacrifices, but it was just to put on a religious show. And God not only didn't accept them, that verse says he considered those sacrifices to be works of self-righteousness. And he says, they're filthy rags in my sight too. And now, even the things that unsaved Jews did in the New Testament to serve the Lord Jesus Christ were also sins, as he himself tells you in Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. We're serving you by doing those things. But then will I profess unto them, Depart ye that work iniquity. Well, hey, prophesying and casting out devils, those are, those are wonderful ways to serve the Lord. But when they're done by unsaved Jews, they're just more examples of filthy rags. Filthy rags of religious works of iniquity. Now, up until this point, Paul's just been quoting verses that give just the facts, like they used to say on Dragnet. Remember, just the facts, man. He's just been quoting verses that just state how sinful men are. But, God Almighty knows the power of a colorful metaphor. So he had the prophets use them back there in the Old Testament. And Paul knew the power of a colorful metaphor too, so he starts quoting those colorful metaphors in verse 13, where he says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit, and the poison of deadly snakes. The poison of asps is under their lips. <laughs> There's a good picture of mankind, huh? Now, saying that their throat's an open sepulcher, that might sound like an odd metaphor. But when you go to the doctor, doesn't he always say, open your mouth and say, ah. That's because your throat is a good barometer of your overall health. And that verse says, when God looks down the throat of mankind, it's like looking into an open grave that's filled with the putrid decay of rotting flesh. You watch a police drama on TV. Sometimes they have to exhume the body to, to get the evidence to solve the case. 
And when they open that casket, the stench is, is so vile that they often show men gagging and vomiting. And God says, that's what it's like looking down the throat of the human race. Now Jews, as we said, they weren't as sinful as Gentiles, but all that made them was what the Lord called them in Matthew 23, 27. Whited sepulchers, which appear beautiful, but they too are full of dead men's bones. Unsaved Jews tried to cover up their sins by acting all pious and holier than thou. But the Lord said, that's just like putting a fresh coat of paint over a pile of nauseating, rotting flesh. And here's the kicker. In making this quotation, you're not going to believe what Paul is actually calling unsaved Jews. Because the verse that Paul's quoting here is in Psalm 5, 8 and 9, where David talked about mine enemies. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. David said that it was the throats of his enemies that were an open sepulcher. And David's enemies would be God's enemies. You see, sin doesn't just make God a little upset with the human race. It makes men his enemies. Even the Jews. As God says in Isaiah 1, 23 and 24, where he told the Jews, Thy princes are rebellious. Therefore, I will avenge me of mine enemies. Even the sins of God's chosen people in Israel made them his enemies. Now, here I have to pause to point out that the verses Paul quotes in the next few verses here in this passage are all passages of scripture that talk about the tribulation that's going to come after the rapture. And there's a reason for that, folks. The tribulation is going to be a time of hell on earth. As you see when John describes the tribulation in Revelation 9, 6, by saying that in those days shall men desire to die and death shall flee from them. Men in hell are going to wish they could die instead of having to continue to suffer the torments of hell. And men in the tribulation are going to wish the same thing. And the reason that Paul is quoting tribulation passages to prove that men are under sin is to point out that the sins of men make the world hell on earth in any dispensation, folks. And you know that these are tribulation verses, because look what, look what it says in Psalm 10, verses 2 to 7. The wicked doth persecute the poor and will not seek after God, under his tongue is mischief and vanity. And the wicked there is the Antichrist. Isn't that what Paul calls him in your next reference? 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, 9. Then shall that wicked with a capital W be revealed. And Psalm 10 says that the wicked is going to persecute believers who are poor because they don't take the mark of the beast. And they can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Did you know the mark has another name? Moses predicted 
in Deuteronomy 32, 5 and 33. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Oh, now watch this. Their wine is the cruel venom of asps. In the tribulation, go home and read Revelation 7. I didn't have room for that in the references today. In the tribulation, God is going to mark the 144,000 with His mark. With His spot. And Moses says the spot of the beast, that's not going to be the spot of God's children. And Moses is predicting that the men who take the mark of the beast are symbolically said to drink the venomous wine of asps. And that would put the venom of asps under their lips, like Paul says there in our text. And hey, if that's what you've got under your lips when you talk, well, then it's going to be true of you what Paul says in verse 14. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And that's another quote from Psalm 10. Where it says of the Antichrist in verses 2 and 7. The wicked, his mouth is full of cursing and de deceit. Now, as it says there. The beast's mouth is going to be full of cursing and deceit, not bitterness, like Paul says in verse 14 here. But that's because he's going to be one tricky dude. <laughs> he's going to make Tricky Dick Nixon look sorry by comparison. Anybody old enough to remember when they, when they called Richard Nixon Tricky Dick? Yeah. When I was... Uh, First starting to date, I sent my first girlfriend for some flowers. And uh, that made one of uh, her sisters wonder what I was up to. So she started calling me Tricky Ricky. <laughs> well, listen. The Antichrist, his mouth is going to be full of cursing and deceit. But the mouth of the beast's followers are going to be filled with cursing and bitterness. Because believe it or not, you look up the word bitterness in the, in the dictionary, the very first word it uses to define it is sharp. Something tastes bitter, it's sharp. And look what the psalm is prayed in Psalm 140, verses 1 and 3, Psalm 52, 2 and 57, 4. Deliver me, he prayed. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. The beasts, stormtroopers, are going to persecute the poor with sharpness. And the beast is going to persecute the poor with deceit and sneaky flattery. And you put those things together, and that is a deadly combination. As you see when Paul goes on to say in verse 15 of our text, their feet are swift to shed blood. And it's talking about the blood of believers who refuse the mark. And all that a believer would have, is going to have to do in those days to live and not die is join the Antichrist's crowd. So in your next reference, Solomon warns them not to in Proverbs 1, 10, 14 to 16. If sinners say, come, let us wait, lay wait for blood. Cast in thy lot among us. If they say that, Solomon says, refrain thy foot from their path for their feet make haste to shed blood. Believers in that day are going to be severely tempted to join the persecutors so they can stop being persecuted. 
Because in your next verse, in speaking of the persecutors, Paul says in verse 16, destruction and misery are in their way. And when a believer finds himself in the path of destruction and misery in the tribulation, there's another temptation he's going to have to resist. It's the one described in Proverbs 31, 7 and 8, where he uses those words, destruction and misery. Let him drink and forget his poverty that he got from not taking the mark and remember his misery no more. All such are appointed to destruction. In the tribulation, there is going to be a strong temptation to just get drunk, to forget how poor you are because you didn't take the mark, and because you're living in hell on earth. But the Apostle Peter wrote two letters to those tribulation saints. And do you know, in those two letters, he tells them to stay sober three times. Because if they get drunk, they just smart, might take the mark of the beast. And damn their souls forever. And, quote, and Paul quotes another tribulation passage in verse 17 when he says about those, those followers of Antichrist, the way of peace have they not known. Now here Paul's quoting Isaiah 59, 8 to 20, 7 to 20. Their feet haste to shed blood, wasting and destruction are in their paths, the way of peace they know not. And then at the end of the chapter says, when the enemy come like a flood, the Redeemer with a capital R, the Lord Jesus Christ shall come. And you know that's a tribulation passage because it calls the Antichrist, it compares him to a flood. And in desert areas like the Mideast, a flood always starts out looking like a blessing. It starts to rain in the desert. Men rejoice because rain's a blessing, right? But as the waters rise into a flood, the thing that started out looking like a blessing turns into a terrible curse. And that describes the Antichrist to a T. He's going to start out looking like the blessing of the Messiah that Jews are still looking for. And they're going to rejoice. But then he'll turn into a terrible curse. And persecute the poor until the Redeemer comes to save them. And the last passage that Paul quotes is another description of the beast and his followers. Verse 18 says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. Now that's a quote from Psalm 36, 1 to 3. The wicked, there is no fear of God before his eyes. Why not? For he flattereth himself in his own eyes. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. The beast isn't going to fear God because he flatters himself to think that he is God. Go home and read that in 2 Thessalonians 2. And his minions, they're not going to fear God either because they think they're serving the man who is God in the flesh. Now, remember what we've been saying since we started this study of Romans. In presenting all of this evidence that men are under sin, Paul is presenting God's evidence in a legal courtroom type of setting like you see in TV shows. Or maybe you've seen in person. That's none of my business. I don't know. 
And how many times have you seen Sam Waterston on Law and Order call a medical expert to the witness stand to testify against the defendant? Well, that's what Paul is doing here in talking about men's throats and their tongues and their lips and their mouths. The great physician, God Almighty, is conducting a forensic examination of mankind and making the determination that men are sick in the head. <laughs> because a man's throat and tongue and lips and mouth are all found in his head. Right? And Jews who heard Paul quote all those verses about the throat and the lips and the mouth and the tongues. They would think of what God said about Israel in Isaiah 1, 4, and 5. Ah, sinful nation, the whole head is sick. And then when Paul talked about how men's feet are swift to shed blood and how the, the paths and the ways they walk in with their feet cause misery and destruction. Oh, ho, ho. That would make Jews think of the rest of what Isaiah said. The rest of what God said in Isaiah 1, 5, and 6. The whole head is sick from the sole of the foot even unto the head. There is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises. And what's that next word? Putrefying sores. And that's talking about the kind of putrefying, rotting flesh you find in an open grave. We have a phrase for a description like that, folks. We'd say that guy is sick from head to toe. Right? Mankind suffers from a spiritual form of foot and mouth disease. <laughs> But to get to Paul's point here, I know it's getting late. To get to Paul's point here, the tribulation verses he's been quoting, they apply more to the people in Paul's day than in any other day because they were the people who would have gone into the tribulation if the dispensation of grace hadn't interrupted prophecy. So those verses, those tribulation verses were written about them. But as I said, when men in any dispensation act like the beast or his followers act, it leads to hell on earth. Don't you ever feel like watching the news is like looking into an open sepulcher in our own day? I know I do. That's why I try not to watch the news. And if you don't think men's mouths are filled with cursing and bitterness, you don't get out much, do you? Because that's what you hear. I heard somebody dropping F-bombs at, at the grocery store the other day. And they're swift to shed blood for things as stupid as road rage. Or they'll kill you to get your Air Jordans. I looked it up. That still goes on. And if you want to talk about deceit and flattery, well, the beast is going to use flattery on believers to, you know, get them to take his mark. But the principle of the sinfulness of deceit and flattery, oh, oh, that's a timeless principle, folks. Because men are always flattering others to get something out of them. When Pastor Stam bought that computerized typesetting machine in 1975, the one he hired me to learn to operate, he was, he'd been at this a long time <laughs> by this time. He was in his 70s. And he insisted that the company he bought that thing from give him a trial period before he made the purchase final. 
And I got to tell you, as the salesman trained me during that trial period, he flattered me so much that one day after he left, Pastor Stan took me aside and warned me of what he was up to. <laughs> it's funny the things you remember. I, I could still hear his voice saying, yeah, you're the best, I'm the best, our business manager Fred's the best. He's just trying to make sure we go through with the purchase. He didn't want it to go to my head. Years ago, a man who owned his own business attended our church for a little while. And he told me, <laughs> he said, you know, it, it's taken me some time to get used to your people being nice to me because when I'm at work, people are nice to me to get something out of me. <laughs> and that's the way the world works. But lying and deceiving and flattering people just to get riches or just to get ahead in the world, that makes men just like the Antichrist. And it makes the world hell on earth. And when you as a believer act the way that Paul's describing in this passage, you're acting like a man who's going to be the devil incarnate. And I do it too. And when we do, we're contributing to making the world hell on earth. We're acting like Antichrist followers who are all going to say what it says in Psalm 12, 3 and 4. Flattering lips have said, Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? And that is no way for a believer to act because Christ is Lord over us. But, the reverse of all this is true too. Because when you refuse to act like this, when you take a stand and, and draw a line in the sand and say to the tempter, I, I double dog dare you to cross it, you can make your little corner of the world heaven on earth. For you and everybody around you. And that, that's why your Savior rose from the dead, folks. To make you a sanctified saint who makes your little corner of the world a spiritual oasis in the throat of an open sepulcher. And if this didn't sound like much of an Easter message, Look what Paul told the sinful saints in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. He told those sinful saints, if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead after dying for our sins, we'd all still be dead in the sins that make us smell like an open sepulchre. The core of the message of Christ's resurrection isn't the empty tomb and it's not the angels telling the women that he's risen. Those are just the facts of his resurrection and they're important facts and Jim will get to them eventually in his study of Luke in Sunday school. But if you want to know the meaning of the resurrection, it's found in Paul's epistles. It's the story of the deliverance from our sins that his resurrection gives us and the glorious child of God that his resurrection makes us. But if you're watching the video today or listening to the recording or if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I hope you noticed that we saw proof that your good works won't save you. 
Your religious works won't save you. The things you do to serve the Lord won't save you. The only thing that will save you is what that last verse says. Your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray that if there's one here this morning that hasn't put all of his or her faith in what your Son did for him on Calvary's cross, pray that they might do that now. Because your, your word says in the book of Acts, chapter 16 and verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then, Father, we as believers just rejoice in our risen Savior this morning. The one who gives us hope beyond the grave and light beyond the tomb. Send us away rejoicing this morning. We pray it in the Savior's name. Amen.